the Port of Baltimore has the most significant amount of emphasis. What we're seeing right here is a visual of the collapse cycle. Over here is where we have the dolly. This area, everything that you see here in the black, just to get an understanding of scale, everything we see here in the black, that's 700 feet and a depth of 50. What we're talking about, so this is the main chart area, the main chatter area, and we know for all vehicles, for all vehicle transports, and also for the containers that are, that are carrying the vehicle transports, you need a depth of at least 35 in order for the vehicles, for the new vehicles, and also the heavy vehicles to be able to move through the Port of Baltimore. This right here is 50, apologize, this right here is 50 at 700 feet. The areas that thus far have been opened up are 11 feet and 14 feet. Just as an understanding of scale and what we're talking about, both for the 11 foot channel that's now open and the 14 foot channel that's now opening. Neither one of those two channels are on this map. Just to get a sense of the scope and the scale of what we're talking about. So we know that for that, in order for that to happen, for example, to get those vehicles, and what's going to happen is as we can then get to a 35-foot depth and a 35-foot draw, then we can start getting the larger ships back on. The reason it also becomes so important is because once you can start transporting vehicles, it's not only, it's not only that uh, it impacts the large vessels, but if you look at what happens with those vehicles, that supports the lives and the livelihoods of at least 100 longshoremen every time a large vessel can pull into the port of Baltimore. So we have a long road ahead, but I'm grateful that because of the extraordinary work of this team and the people who are out there, that work is moving. On the third piece, we're gonna take care of our people. Last week, the Biden-Harris administration accepted our request to approve the Small Business Administration's disaster relief declaration, and they accepted it within hours. Today, the Lieutenant Governor, Senator Cardin, Congressman Councilmember Costello, and I visited the new Business Resource Center that's been set up as part of that declaration. And together, we had a chance to speak with Marylanders who were coming in to get the support. We also had a chance to speak with this remarkable staff. And together, we had a chance to meet people like Yaritza Perez Acosta. She's been working with the Small Business Administration since 2018. She lives in Puerto Rico, and she just came from a disaster declaration site in Rhode Island. Her work is remarkable, and I thank her for her service, and it's because of her work that she's able to see people like Casey, Casey who has a tire business, or she's able to see people like Will, individuals like Will who own a trucking business and has two employees and is trying to figure out what his next steps are going to be. People like Yaritza sees them and she supports them and we're all grateful. We now have two business resource centers that are fully operational. One permanent location in Baltimore City and the other temporary location in Baltimore County. And we will have news on a permanent location in Baltimore County soon. So to all Marylanders looking for hours and locations, please visit sba.gov and you can get all the information that you need. Yesterday, we also formed a new intergovernmental economic response team. The Lieutenant Governor will chair the first meeting this evening. And I've appointed three members of my staff to work with the Lieutenant Governor on that effort. Deputy Chief of Staff, Manny Welch, Deputy Chief of Staff, Johnny Dorsey, and Chief Performance Officer, Asma Mirza, and they're working around the clock to make sure that we're taking care of our workers and our businesses and everyone affected by the economic consequences of this collapse. One of the mantras in the military we had was, mission first, people always. And that is the mindset that we are applying to this effort. I'm also working closely with the Maryland General Assembly on the Port Act. Our team has offered several amendments to that piece of legislation, and today I just briefly want to highlight three of them. The first, we propose the creation 
of a new permanent scholarship program for the families of transportation workers who die on the job. The work that these men and women do every single day is both essential and dangerous, and we must ensure that when there are tragedies like this one, that the state does not forget about their children and their families. Mission first, people always. Second, we propose flexibility in work search requirements in work search requirements for unemployment insurance. That way, port workers who receive unemployment insurance will be ready to return to work at the port when operations move back to normal. Mission first, people always. Third, we propose an amendment that will ensure flexibility for our Department of Commerce and our Department of Labor, because our goal is to make funding available for critical needs of workers and businesses as we move forward, mission first, and people always. We cannot possibly find every answer to every problem in the next few days before session ends. But we can give the state the ability to respond and quickly over these next months. I also want to take a second to talk a bit about the state budget. When session began, our administration introduced a responsible budget that did not raise taxes. The House and the Senate have been moving through their process over the last several weeks to get a final budget to my desk for signature, and we are now seven days from the end of session. So yesterday, I signed an executive order extending the legislative session by 10 days. I recognize that the House and the Senate are coming to the table with different perspectives. I know they are both working in good faith to achieve a resolution. And the parties are not that far apart. We all want to do what's best for the people of this state. So what I did yesterday was necessary that we can provide both the House and the Senate the time to find a reasonable compromise and get me a budget that I can sign. Now fourth, on rebuilding. We cannot rebuild the bridge until we clear the wreckage. But I'm telling you, we are going to get this done. We will clear the channel. We will move the dolly. We will rebuild the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Every day, I meet more people who prove what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. And today, we are here with Chief Petty Officer Morgan Merritt from the US Coast Guard. She's in charge of the AIDS navigation team. And they're the ones who help make these temporary channels navigable by commercial vessels. Her team was out in the pouring rain this morning, laying down navigation markers so ships could move through. There was nothing that was going to stop her emergency. And while, uh, while she might have been born in Fort Pierce, I got to tell you today, you're a Maryland. And we're thankful for you. Thank you. So in this moment, I'm going to hand it over to Admiral Gilry, who's going to be speaking for Unified Command. And then following him, we'll be joined by Colonel Pinchasen of the Army Corps of Engineers, Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation, Paul Wiedefeld, Senator Ben Cardin, and the Mayor of Baltimore City, my friend Brandon Scott. I want to thank all of our additional partners for being here today. So now, I'll turn it over to Admiral Gilry, representing Unified Command. Good afternoon, I'm Mayor Admiral Shannon Gilreath. One week ago today, we were in this very room at about this time holding our very first Unified Command meetings with all of the first responders that came to help in this tragedy. And so while the uniforms of some of those first responders have changed and some of the faces of the responders have changed, their dedication has not. And I'm so proud of the folks, Governor, thank you for recognizing many of the folks at the Unified Command and taking the time to do that, sir. You and the mayor and all the officials that have come by to say thank you to them. Uh, we truly appreciate that support. Their dedication remains unchanged and we are going to get this mission done. So let me give you an update on where we are today on those priorities. So priority number one still remains to reopen the deep shaft channel. 
Colonel Pinchason's going to give you some more details on the challenges of that in just a few minutes. Our number two priority is to remove the dolly from the channel. And we continue to work on that. We've got divers going down today. They're still continuing to survey around the ship. We've got engineers that are working to plan how we remove portions of the bridge from the dolly as well as remove damaged containers. And our third priority is to remove the rest of the bridge from the waterway. And we continue working along those lines led by the efforts of the Maryland Department of Transportation and their contractors. And so yesterday we had a planned lift of one of those sections. Uh, the weather has delayed that lift and so we haven't yet completed it, but it's still in the process and we're still working to get that done over time. We just can't do that lift in lightning and some of those other conditions are making that challenging, but from a safety perspective, it's unsafe to operate those cranes when we don't have lightning in the area. So we're going to continue to work to do that, but we've got to do that safely. Now, as the governor mentioned, we have made progress in a couple other areas. We have reopened that northern channel that we spoke about yesterday with our first two barges to traffic through there. And we just reopened that southern channel today at a draft of 14 feet. We're going to continue working and planning for a third alternate channel when we get those spans that are just north of the UJAP channel removed. But that's still going to take us some time to do that. So I want to thank you again for your support. I want to turn it over to Colonel Pinchason to give us an update on the actual challenges that we're finding with that deep draft channel and engineering that her team and the Navy Supervisor of Salvage team and our contractors are doing on that. Colonel Pinchason. So Governor Moore, state partners, sir, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for joining us today. Our priority remains clearing the federal channel, that 50-foot shipping channel, and that is an integrated operation for salvage operations and recovery operations. And when you mentioned earlier, sir, mission first, people always, that's exactly what that is. It's not just about the engineering. And I just, as you mentioned that, that's what came to me because as our engineers are assessing and surveying and figuring out how they're gonna lift those loads, they know in the back of their minds that they are also looking for any traces of, of the fallen and anything that they can recover. That is an integrated part of our effort. Mission first, people always. So thank you for inspiring that, sir. Yesterday and today, our teams are, our teams are working as best they can considering the weather. Crane operations had to be paused temporarily but they're back online now. The lightning hindered that for a little while, but as, as Admiral mentioned, we're able to continue in a safe fashion. We're taking every precaution we can to make sure our folks are safely operating and conducting salvage operations. The Unified Command consists of an amazing team of Department of Defense, federal, state, and industry partners from the salvage community. It is absolutely the right team to take on this challenge. And so we've implemented a very methodical, disciplined, but iterative approach where we assess an engineer and then execute. And we're getting much, a much better understanding of what we're dealing with by bringing in our, another dive team, by bringing in 3D survey capability and employing that over the last few days and getting a much better picture than what you're seeing on the skyline. We're gonna cover that there. What those 3D surveys demonstrated for us and what they're indicating is that the wreckage on the bottom of the 50-foot channel is far more extensive than, than we could have imagined. Um, what we're seeing, when, and, uh, and I'll head over there here in a second, but we have portions of the wreckage that are completely collapsed. What this means is that the state of that wreckage makes it very difficult to figure out where to cut, how to cut, to put it into what we call bite-sized pieces, although the bites we've had are 250 tons. <laughs> and, there, and we have crane capability that can lift more than that, so imagine these bite-sized pieces that are hundreds of tons. 
but to be able to do that, we have to be able to see what we're doing. And the collapse of that wreckage, it's not just sitting on the, on the seabed, it's actually below the mud line. That makes it very difficult to know where to cut, how to cut, how to lift and rig, rig and lift. So I just wanted to make sure that we're sharing everything that we're learning and I can help explain that a little more. Uh, right now, all those surveys are being compiled from all our partners from across the entire effort with each layer of survey data that we are collecting and compiling and analyzing. We're getting a much better picture of what it's actually going to what it's going to take to lift that up. Um, I can't say enough about our team. Uh, we are joined by our nation's top salvage experts and our friends from the United States Navy, our salvage experts, SoupSal, Supervisor of Salver, Salvage Operations, SoupSal, uh, here with us. We could not do that without them and without our industry partners. Uh, cannot thank them enough, and I hope that the families know they have the absolute best team working on this for them. So we'll head over here and orient you a little to what, we're, what we mean by that. So as the, the governor mentioned, this is a, this is a uh, survey graphic. I know it's a little pixelated. I don't know if we can shift, just be said to shift it on the screen. Okay, this is what you all have seen. I think most of you have been out on site and have seen the wreckage. You've seen spans that look like pretty, stru some structural integrity there. These trusses that we see, that we used to love to see, that beautiful bridge, and they're sitting, laying in the water. But as you see below the water, it starts to get messy, right? It doesn't look like that. You can't even see what that means. You, can't, you don't see any structural integrity there. So while here, this area that we, that we were proposing to cut into bite-sized pieces and be able to place them on barges and, and be able to transport them away, There you go. I'm fully trained now. Um, <laughs> what we're seeing in the water is that the wreckage has been completely collapsed. Some people use the term pancaked. But that's making it very difficult to even determine where to cut, how to cut. It's very dangerous for our divers to be able to go into this area. They can't see anything in front of them. This area is extremely unforgiving for them to work on. So the more data we have, the more surveys we can compile. We're completing survey data from the other side uh, as well, and we're gonna be able to put together a plan to get after this. It might change how we're gonna lift this portion of the collapsed wreckage off the bottom of, of the seabed. You can see here, this wreckage looks still somewhat intact. We're looking here, you see, these are areas where we'll be able to cut and lift, cut and lift, but then as you go below the surface, 50 feet down in the water, it is not something that we're gonna be able to cut through, and we don't wanna put people in danger if, they're, if, if, they're, if there's gonna be instability. So we're now developing our plan for that. Now, just to make sure folks know, this is something that the salvage community knows how to do. That we are marshalling equipment to enable this additional type of lift. So that's when I say that we have the right people on the job figuring out how to get after this, that is 100% true. This is, for us, it looked, it looked very, I don't wanna say clean, I don't wanna make it sound like it's not as complicated, that this is gonna be easy. It is absolutely still complex. Salvage operations are not an easy task. The magnitude of this is enormous, as you've all seen. But as you go deeper in the water, this, does not represent what's underneath the water. So we thought it was really important for you to understand what our divers are dealing with and what, they're, what, they're, what the courage they have to risk um, to, as they're conducting operations. We are taking every precaution to keep them safe. We are making sure that when we send them in that we, they are guided properly, but it's very methodic and, it, and we have to do it very carefully and I know that takes time, but we're very thankful for the support from the governor who understands what it actually is gonna take to do this, and we, we can't thank you enough for that support. 
behind all, all these things. So while the cranes might not be moving, I can't even tell you how much is going on behind the scenes with our engineers. It's, it's humbling to see how hard they're working. Amazing. Any, I mean, I'm gonna hand it off right now to the Secretary of Transportation. You coming over? I'm good. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Paul Wiedefeld, uh, Transportation Secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. Um, the Maryland Department of Tra Transportation continues to work with the Unified Command to advance the Governor Moore's key directives as outlined. As the Governor mentioned, the weather has impacted some of the salvage work, but we continue to make progress. Overall, hundreds of people from across the country and dozens of pieces of equipment are working on our unified response. And as we mentioned earlier, the contractors that we have on board went to, to work immediately. Thank you, Senator. That's using the $60 million that we received from the Federal Highway Administration, which allowed us to get right to work immediately. Uh, we're, when, as has been said, I'm going to repeat it, uh, we're operating at a high level of uh, care for safety, and we will not sacrifice safety for speed. Turning to traffic coordination, the department continues to monitor and adjust the system. This morning, commuters saw higher traffic volumes and crashes with the rain, flooding, and many returning to their normal routine following spring break. I urge everyone to prepare for extra time and please be patient and courteous to your fellow drivers. The State Highway Administration can you just deploy extra emergency response vehicles to help dis disable motors and clear crashes quickly. And we're continuing to monitor traffic and patterns as motorists shift their travel patterns in the Baltimore region. One suggestion for our highway users before you head out, check our traffic cameras to see real-time conditions and plan your best route. You can find our traffic cameras on the website chart.maryland.gov. Governor, you continue to stress the importance of rebuilding the bridge, and I just wanted to make sure people would understand with everything that you're seeing here uh, out there in the background, we're doing the same in planning for the rebuild of the bridge, particularly working with the Federal Highway, uh, Federal Highway Administration to line up everything we need to basically create an innovative uh, and a very quick design and a building process. So in closing, our thoughts at the department are with the victims and the families. We know we mourn with you and we work in honor of your loved ones. Thank you. Senator Carter. Ben Cardin, Senator. First, I just want to give my impression of what a unified command should be like. This is a model of unified command. It has brought together the federal partners, the state partners, our city, our county partners, all together to be united in a mission. And as a result, we've made significant progress. I want to join the governor first in acknowledging our thoughts and prayers with those six that lost their lives and our commitment to bring closure. That has always been our priority and we will continue until closure is brought. Our priorities are to open the channel and to replace the bridge. Governor Moore, I want to thank you for your extraordinary leadership in this state. You have brought us all together with a mission and you've inspired us that we will not rest until we accomplish that mission. We're going to get it done, and we're going to get it done safely. Admiral, I can't thank you enough in regards to what the Coast Guard has done, and Colonel, in regards to the Army Corps. Our partners have been here. I'm frequently asked, uh, as a, from our federal congressional delegation, will the federal government be there with the resources that Baltimore needs? Well, look at what resources have already been made available to Baltimore. The Army Corps has had the expertise of federal agencies They've had the, the money, they've had the resources, they've had the equipment. President Biden has made sure that, that will be done. We have the resources necessary to deal with the mission of, of cleaning up the, the channel. And as Secretary Wiedefeld says, we have the resources to start the replacement of the bridge and to deal with the challenges, transportation challenges, with the bridge coming down. Next week, I have scheduled a meeting for our congressional delegation with the OMB, Office of Management and Budget, with the state of Maryland, to make sure that we coordinate in Congress with the Biden administration to make sure they have all the resources they need to complete the mission in Baltimore. We recognize that the priority now is to open the channel. We can't replace the bridge until the channel is opened, although we start planning it. 
but we need to make sure that we have the commitment moving forward to replace the bridge with the type of bridge befitting our community and the needs of our community. We are committed to making sure that happens. I want to talk a little bit about Trade Point Atlantic because they're making some modifications today that will help us in transition because that's before the bridge. In 2020, Senator Van Hollen and I worked to get a port grant to Trade Point Atlantic to make it more capable to deal with port activities. I want to thank again the Biden administration for being willing to modify that grant so that we can deal with what Governor Morris talked about, the roll one, roll off needs of the port through Trade Point Atlantic. It's that type of flexibility, it's that type of action that is allowing us to try to mitigate the severe damage to our economy and the regional economy as a result of the channel being blocked. I want you to know it is a team effort. Senator Van Hollen and I have worked closely with the Moore administration along with Cong Congressman Infume and our entire congressional delegation. Mayor Scott, thank you for your extraordinary leadership working with your <coughs> counterparts, the county execs of the Inter Arundel County and Baltimore County. I had a chance earlier today to visit the small business uh, operations in, uh, in Dundalk. Excuse me, in, uh, around here. In, uh, it, it was actually in East Baltimore. I had a chance to see firsthand how important the SBA programs will be. Make no mistake about it, small businesses are the growth engine of our economy. That's where we get job growth, they are innovative, they figure out ways to do things. When you think of the Port of Baltimore, when you think of a port, you don't necessarily think about the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small businesses that are making that port operate. Many of the transports are done by independent contractors and small businesses. Now, they do things well, so we have an efficient port, but they don't have deep pockets. They're not prepared for this type of disaster. Administrator Guzman called me on the day of the tragedy to let me know that she believed that this would qualify for emergency assistance. She already put together a team to come to Baltimore to help us. And as soon as the, 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 the state could come forward with their application, it was approved at the federal level. And it means so much. The governor talked about some of those business owners that we saw today. One has two employees and two trucks, and he'll be out of business unless he gets some help. And what we're gonna be able to do through this program is give that person the hope that they, the help that they need now and with the traffic coming through the port, the business, so that they can stay in business. So this has been a team effort. Our federal congressional delegation governor is with you. We're going to do everything to make sure you get the help that you need from your federal partners. And I want to thank all of our federal partners who have been here from day one, and they're not going to leave until mission accomplished. Governor, uh, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Uh, good afternoon. A week ago today, our city, our state, and our region endured a massive and unspeakable tragedy. Uh, but despite uh, the pain, uh, Maryland and Baltimore did what we always do. We came together to support those in need and to begin uh, the recovery from this unspeakable tragedy. I want to thank you all for continuing to be here to bring attention uh, to this story as we work to build a Baltimore back and overcome the multitude of challenges it's posing to our city, state, and region. Uh, and of course, uh, first and foremost, again, uh, the thoughts and prayers of all of Baltimore will now and forever be with those who we lost. In the excitement of yesterday's progress in establishing a channel uh, for some emergency and some commercial vessels, I don't want us to lose sight uh, of the fact that we still have four Marylanders missing below the water. And we know that every single person uh, in Unified Command, every single first responder, everybody that is out there in front or behind the scenes is not going to forget uh, those folks. And uh, I know that no one up here will rest until we bring them home and provide closure to their families. 
Yesterday, we talked about meeting uh, with the union members from ILA and making the same commitment to them uh, that we made to the families, that we will always be with them to see this through alongside them. Last night, I had the opportunity to uh, meet with business owners impacted by the port closure, some of those small businesses that Senator Cardin was just speaking about alongside my counterparts, County Executive Olszewski and Pittman, uh, representatives from the port, from the governor's team, Unified Command, to talk about what the outlook for their businesses look like and how we can work with them to overcome it together. The road ahead is long and difficult, but we will navigate the challenges ahead and utilize every single tool we have to support businesses and their workforces. And we'll do that uh, the same way we've done everything since that first phone call together in coordination, each relying on our unique tools and assets. Everyone should know, no matter how hard it is, our city will come out stronger, our state will come out stronger, and we will be more unified and more ready for the future uh, than we were before this unspeakable tragedy. And we'll do that by focusing on our city and state's greatest asset, our people. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Governor Moore. We're going to take questions. I'm going to start with WTOP. Could, could you say, uh, what are the engineers' expectations for the survey? And it, you're using, what, a submersible uh, side skin uh, sonar? It, is one deployed, or is it more than one? And I know that. Uh, it's going to take time and you're doing it safely, but is there a sense of when the survey might be complete and you could actually say So this, I don't know, I don't know if you've um, heard me speak about this before, but it is an iterative process. I can, it's not going to be that, okay, we finished all the surveys, we're complete. It's not. We are surveying after every single lift. Now, the 3D surveys that we're using, uh, it's a COBRA system, it's a 3D multi-beam side scan survey system. We have two of them right now, we have multiple dive teams. All the, all the salvage operations, there are three uh, salvers that are working, three different efforts, and they all have survey teams. We also have Corps of Engineers surveyors. It, everyone is sharing their information. All the survey information is coming together. They're informing each other, they're sharing. It is truly a unified command. Uh, the information, the lessons from every lift, every pick, the conditions on the ground, what the divers are seeing, they can't, they're not, they're not going into their separate areas and working on it themselves. They are coming together to give everybody the best picture. They're creating a shared understanding of what the conditions are, what the challenges are, what they're facing. And we have a, an incredible asset from the Navy Supervisor of Salvage that is coordinating this for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and creating a holistic plan for the entire, for the entire effort. And what's taking place on the ground is just, is just phenomenal and creating the best, the best uh, conditions for our surveyors and our divers to be able to inform the salvage operations. All right, Baltimore Sun. Uh, I had a quick question about the 56 hazmat containers. Um, <clears throat> have all of those been accounted for, and are any of those 56 among, among the 14 that have been breached? So that's our question. Uh, your question is regarding the 14 that were crushed? About the 56 hazardous materials containers, if they have been accounted for, and if they're among the 13 that were crushed. They have been accounted for. There are 14 that were crushed. Gotcha. Yes. So they have been accounted for. Gotcha. And I have another question about frames. Um, <coughs> the, the Chesapeake 1000 and the Weeks 533, have those been put to use yet? Can we elaborate on what those are being used for? I have to refer to you. <coughs> I am Captain South Sworn of Supervisor South. They have not been used yet. Uh, there are smaller cranes that are in operation at this moment um, for uh, the quote unquote smaller lifts. Um, really, we brought them all on station to have them in standby for when we need to go to larger uh, lifts. Um, 
NBC News. Oh. Hold on one second. NBC right here. Hi, I know the colonel spoke to this a little bit, but I was wondering, the images released by the Navy of the underwater wreckage were really striking. I was wondering if you could speak to what they reveal about the challenges of getting that channel fully open for those larger vessels and what it says about a possible timeline for that. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we see is, uh, is as complicated as the overwater images are, I think one thing happened is once we actually got a chance to see the, the submerged 3D imagery, uh, that what we see under the water is even more complicated. Uh, that we are literally talking about mangled metal that goes to the depths of the, go, goes to the, depths of the sea floor. Uh, and also how you see it's not just in one certain area, uh, you see it literally throughout from the, from the, from the point of where the ship, uh, from before where the ship begins, all the way down to the more shallow areas. So I think one of the things we continue to see as we continue to look through the imagery and understand the underwater imagery is, uh, is the complexity is even more complex than we thought going in, um, just because of how submerged, how intertwined, and how mangled uh, the metal really is. So it continues to highlight the fact that we said this was gonna be a long road. Uh, this continues to confirm this is going to be a long road. It's also something that we know that there are still, as I mentioned before, there are still a lot of unknowns um, that we're still working to understand and dissect. Uh, we're committed to making sure we get this done. We're committed to making sure we get this done to completion, but uh, we want to be very clear, this is not a simple operation. In many ways, this is a very unprecedented operation and level of complexity. We're gonna start on this side and then again. Um, AP? Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk more about what allowed um, for the second So there were several things that needed to happen. The first thing we needed to do was a survey that we did in conjunction with NOAA and the Army Corps of Engineers to actually see what the depths were in that area. And then we identified a pre-existing obstruction that the State of Maryland Department of Transportation and their contractor were able to go over and basically pull that out of the water for us, which then gave us that 14-foot draft. After that, we asked the Coast Guard Ace Navigation Team under Chief Merritt to go out there and actually mark that channel so that mariners could see how to visually navigate through that section of the bridge and span and do that safely. And so those were the steps that went into it. The Unified Command reviewed all of that material after it was marked and made the decision it was safe to open that alternate channel. Similar things went into the first channel, there just wasn't an obstruction there now. Okay, was the obstruction that piece that you mentioned yesterday that was... Y yes, that was the piece that we mentioned yesterday. Yes, ma'am. And do you have any timeline on opening the um, third channel at this time? So the third channel will depend upon when we can complete the removal of the bridge obstructions in that section north of the UCAT channel. So after that's completed, then we'll complete a survey, and then we will mark that channel as well. All right, CBS News. Um, this is to the governor at the SBA sites that you visited or you visited today. Did the staff give you an update of the number of businesses that have applied for the aid? Um, and you mentioned 57 businesses have applied already. Do you have an update on that count? Yes, uh, so they told us that 57 had come in uh, and had come in online before. They were still calculating the numbers that had come in thus far for the day, but the indication that we got was that already the number was in the dozens uh, of people. And what, what they were noticing was not just a flow of people who were both going online and going through the process, but a steady flow of people who are actually coming in to get their questions answered and put together in-person applications as well. So they've indicated that the, the flow has been steady, and, uh, and but the thing they also showed us is that they're prepared for it. Um, did they give you any indication that they're seeing a trend of what types of businesses are applying at the initial onset? So the, the uh, in fact, we were actually speaking about that when we first went in, uh, the senator uh, and I were asking this question. Uh, all, the, all the things that they're seeing are people who have some form of attachment to the port. So whether it is a truck driver 
who was running routes, uh, you know, using the port as, as an entity. Whether it was, uh, I mentioned before about KC, who had a tire company, and some of the specific vehicles that he was making tires for were tires that were, were destined for either the new car placements or the vehicles that were coming into the port. So the only consistent thread that they told us they were seeing uh, was just showing that the, the variance of impact that this port, uh, that the maritime operations of the port were having on individual businesses. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, question you. for Senator Carter. Anybody else who wants to weigh in? Can you just want to speak a little bit to uh, what uh, any potential congressional appropriation will cover? You mentioned to start construction and when you would expect the White House to formally request those funds. In the short term, there's no need for additional appropriations to be made. There are pots of dollars that are available that are unleashed under emergency <coughs> declarations, and those funds are flowing, including in regards to the preliminaries to a new key bridge. Uh, there are agency budgets that cover a lot of these needs. Uh, we are, they're prepared for these types of emergencies. So there's been no slowing down, and we don't anticipate any slowing down. There is a limit to how much funds are appropriated. So there comes a time when you have to replenish those funds. That goes through the normal, in many cases, the normal appropriation process is not necessarily designated to Baltimore or keep key bridge, but there are going to be funds that are going to be necessary to be replenished as a result of this type of a, an emergency. When you have a tragedy like this, a catastrophic event to an infrastructure that has national significance, the Congress has come together to make sure the resources are there so that infrastructure can be replaced. And I want to acknowledge Senator McConnell, the Republican leader of the Senate, for his positive comments today about the federal government will be there. All right, we'll take our last question from the app room. Um, as traffic is diverted, pressure is being put on the Harbor Tunnel, um, open in 1957, and the Fort McHenry Tunnel, open in 1985. Uh, is there a concern about tunnels and surrounding buildings aging quicker than why we'll get them to the of traffic, these tunnels are seen over the period of time, uh, with the new world of the and the building? Thank you. We've seen approximately uh, 15,000 additional vehicles a day on the Fort McHenry, about 7,000 on the, on the Harbor Tunnel. So over time, yes, they will have an impact. So what we will do is we'll monitor the condition of those facilities and make any necessary improvements to make sure that their, the safety of those facilities are maintained. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.